So we're uh, happy again to have uh, Mike Dottier come to give his third talk today on uh, Geometry Explores the Nucleus. Thank you. Uh, well, so this is the third, last talk. Now, as I explained at the beginning, this is still an exploration. Uh, results are still, I haven't finished. I'm just exploring. Lots and lots of questions aren't settled. So at the end of this lecture, there'll be lots of things. Needs more thought. Needs more thought. And a long list of questions. So I'll start off with telling you a bit more about what I've so far succeeded in doing. And I remind you what I did last time. And I remind you this nice little picture I sketched at the end last time. This is my picture of how you have to think of adding little bits of matter to the universe. This is my sort of geometrical idea. Um, now, um, and I'll remind you quickly what I last what I got. Are these models for matter? Now, I apologize that the uh, beautiful black color fades in 24 hours. It goes a kind of greeny color. You know, in the old, the old paintings of the Italian Renaissance painters, after 400 years, their color changes a little bit. <laughs> About 400 minutes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the, the, the prototype models, I've got four models, uh, which I start with, and I call them prototypes, which I'll explain what, exactly what I mean. So I'll remind you, the, the four manifolds are four-dimensional flat space, the four-dimensional round sphere, the complex projective plane, the standard metric, and this interesting one here, the complex projective plane with the real projective plane removed. These are four manifolds. You notice that two of them are compact, and two of them are not compact. And these ones are compactifications of those by adding in pieces you've taken out. Uh, and these are going to be models for baryons. These are going to be models for leptons. Remember, the leptons are things like the electron and the neutrino, and the uh, baryons are things like the proton and the neutron. So this is the, this is the matter, and this is the electric, el these are the, the lepton part of it. Mainly I want to talk about this, but since I found everything I was doing here had a parallel there, it seems logical to include it. Now, the idea is that, first of all, in each of these, if the non-compact spaces, you look at infinity, and infinity, then you should, oh, this manifold has to have a circle action, or at least an approximate circle action, and then when you factor out by the circle, uh, you get a, a vibration. So in the first case of R4, you think of it as C2, you act by the circle, which is the unit complex numbers, then you get the three-sphere, which is what you see at infinity in R4, fibers over the two-sphere, the famous vibration pop. Uh, and in, in the, three, what you, the two-sphere sits in the three-space, the three-space is where we live, ordinary three-space. The second circle is the extra circle I said we added, this kaluta klein theory. So in ordinary space, you see just this two-sphere, and you see it from the outside. You look in, inside, that is this uh, object you're trying to describe the particle. And, but so the important thing is that in this case, the uh, topological vibration is churn class 1, and that's why this uh, represents something with electrical charge 1. The electrical charge is seen by the topology at infinity. And if there's no infinity, a compact manifold, there is no charge. In the other case, uh, there's something similar but more subtle happens, and I should say a bit more about that. Because when I started to look at this example, and there were lots of reasons why I wanted this example, it kept thinking, looking it was wrong. Instead of getting number one, I kept getting number four. And so I tried to throw it away and try another example and, and so on. And, but eventually, I fought hard, and I managed to divide four by four to get one. <laughs> and I'll, try to, I'll just tell you a little bit about this. Rather, not, no, it's a bit subtle. When you go to infinity, in, in CP2, the infinity is near RP2. So at infinity, if you divide by the circle, which is the sort of normal circle to the RP2, you will get RP2, the protein plane. Now, the protein plane has one property. It is, like it or not, it's not orientable. So if you were in R3 and you wanted to look the outside, instead of seeing a two-sphere with something inside, you would see RP2. But RP2 and R3 has no outside. You can't put it in R3 with an inside and outside because it's not orientable. So there's a problem. And uh, how do you solve this problem? Well, the point is that the, RP2 really sits inside a four-dimensional manifold. Uh, and the four-dimensional manifold is oriented. All our four-dimensional manifolds are oriented. RP2 can sit inside an oriented four-dimensional manifold, 
But then the normal bundle to the RP2 is unoriented. It has exactly the same unorientation, so to speak, as the tangent bundle. They, they cancel. They first, so the two together compensate each other. But when you divide by the circle, in this case it's not really dividing by the circle because the circle itself is unoriented. As you go around the RP2, this circle reverses. So the direction of the circle is not fixed. It's a circle, but it's not, a, not an oriented circle. Uh, okay, but now the important observation is that um, uh, uh, once, that means that if the three-dimensional space near this ob object, which is thinking with the proton, is actually locally not orientable. It means you go around once, you have to sort of think of going around some other sheet. It means the local topology around this object is not like R3, but it's like R3 divided by Z2. And R3 divided by Z2 would normally have a conical singularity. But here we don't see that singularity because the interior is not what you think it is. It's this more interesting manifold. So it's okay, but a little subtle. Now the, the, the thing is, <coughs> which surprised me, you see, if you have a four-dimensional manifold which is oriented, and a two-dimensional sub-manifold which is oriented, this defines a cohomology class, and this cohomology class has a Cup square gives you a cycle gives you intersection number, the intersection number defined. Uh, but if you change the orientation of the surface, you don't change the uh, intersection number because, so to speak, you're squaring it. You get plus or always the same answer. More, but surprise, more surprisingly, still the manifold, the surface itself, does not need to be oriented in order to define a self-intersection number. If you have any surface in a four manifold which is not oriented, not orientable, like RP two. Then, because it, the four-manifold is orientable, the normal bundle has to be oriented and has to have the same, exactly the same stiefel whitney class to compensate. So you can take cohomology with local co coefficients in the twisted form with the local coefficient system, in the, at least in the neighborhood, then square that. When you square it, the two twistings cancel, and lo and behold, you can get... So, and you can do it geometrically. You take the, the surface, you deform it a bit, you calculate, and you can show that number is well-defined. So it's something I never thought about before. But none of, a surface need not be oriented. And here, this is, to define the self in the section number, you only need to know how it behaves in, it, near itself. In fact, in the whole four-dimensional manifold, which is CP2, the class of the real Peckett plane is zero. Because it would be, it would be, since it's non-oriented, it doesn't give you an integral class. It gives you a mod 2 class, but it gives you a tri tri trivial class. Well, trivial mod 2 class. So, uh, but be all you need to know is to do the self-intersection. Now, it's a nice exercise, which is not obvious. So the self-intersection of the real predictive plane in the complex plane is 1. Okay? Notice, compare this with the fact that the real, predictive pl the real the complex predictive plane, far away from the real predictive plane, has a conic, the totally imaginary conic. And in fact, when you go down to the fourth sphere, that gives you another comp copy of RP2. And the two conics, the conic in the plane has self-intersection number 4. That's the four that I had a problem with. How could I get rid of this four? Well, the answer is you go to the RP2, you observe that you don't need to double cover it. To, to, you can do it on the ground, and you find self-intersection one. So it, and the signs are right, so it has the right... So this is a good model for the proton after all. It was a great relief because it had all the beautiful properties otherwise, and it was this one bit of topology that held me back a long time. But it is, it, it, it's okay. Now you check it for yourself. It's a nice piece of exercise. Actually, the easiest way to check it is, in fact, to go to the double covering of the complex vector plane, which is branched along the, the other conic, which is then the quadric surface, two cos S2, S2 cross S2. The RP2 up, uh, above gets double covered by an S2. And then you can take the intersection. Now that S2 is the anti-diagonal in the product of two two-spheres. Now, the diagonal or the anti-diagonal in the, in the, has a self-intersection number always equal to the Euler characteristic. Euler characteristic of the sphere is 2. But you've got upstairs, so you, you've got two sheets. So you, to get downstairs, you, the, the points come, you have to divide by 2 again. So you get back to 1. Or if you like, the, the two points where you self-intersect, you deform it, you'll be uh, antipodal points, and down below there will be one point. You can do it very elementarily. So that was a great relief, I have to say, because I, I spent about three months trade with other models, which didn't seem so, so good. When this worked, it was a great relief. <clears throat> Sometimes getting, getting these exact numbers right is absolutely crucial. You cheat. I tried to cheat, but you can't cheat. <laughs> Somebody is watching. So now the, the, 
the, the, the, these four manifolds that I've hinted at are, are the models, the prototype models, not the real models yet, for the, the, the neutrino, the neutron, the electron, the proton. The neutrino is the four sphere. The electron is the C, R, R4. The neutron is the complex positive plane, and the proton is the complex positive plane minus the real positive plane. Okay? The, the, the ones on the, the neutrons, the, new, the ones that have no charge, are compact. The other ones are non-compact, because they have electric charge. The ones in blue have baryons, number, one. They have two cycles inside them. They have signature plus one. The ones in green have no topology. They have no, sorry, they have no two-dimensional topology. So, uh, that's the, now, what we're now going to do with these prototype models is we're going to break some symmetry. Now, observe these models are very symmetrical. You know, they have enormous symmetries. The fourth sphere is a big rotation group. So they all have very, very large symmetry groups. And the idea is you start with this picture of a very, very symmetrical objects, and then you break the symmetry in some way and induce a parameter which deforms them. And that gets you back into a more physical world. And this is an idea physicists have, thought, have in their own language, other language, also think about. They think about, for example, what they call the grand unification scale, when all the forces of nature are the same lengths, same strengths. And then as you change the scale, they, 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 they alter in different ways. This is the same philosophy. Um, now we're going to break this, this, the, the, the symmetry we're talking about here, the particular symmetry, is the SO3 symmetry. There are lots of symmetries. Um, and then we're going to break that down from SO3 to SO2, from the three-dimensional group to the circle. And we're going to do it in two different ways. There, will be two different, there are lots of groups around. We're going to single out the right ones, and we're going to deform in each case break the symmetry, and we'll have a parameter which sort of deforms in that direction. And these two parameters will have different geometrical meaning and different physical meaning. Um, and they both arise in terms of symplectic geometry as moment maps, so they, in some sense they, they, the parameter has a natural set of integer values uh, on it, which may be important physically, well, I'm not too sure. But anyway, so now I'll first tell you what the first parameter, I'll call parameters alpha and beta, because I mean, temporary notation. Now we'll first take the first parameter, alpha. And then we're going to use that parameter. The same deformation will take place both with the le leptons and with the le baryons, parallel. So we'll take the first parameter, alpha, and I'll look first at the electron. Okay? So you start off with the flat metric in R4. Uh, and now you introduce this parameter, alpha, which turns the flat metric in towards, well, well known by physicists for a long time, called the Taubnut metric. By the way, Taubnut is a very odd acronym <laughs> because Taub was a man, Mr. Taub, and NUT are the first initials of three people. So it's a hybrid acronym. So that's why you write NUT in capital letters and Taub in small letters. Um, and when you, when you deform this, this R4, I, I'll later on give you a simple formula. What happens is the, the four dimensional space, if you think of the four dimensional space, very going way to infinity, an ordinary flat metric, you get a very large round three sphere, which is the same size in all directions. But now think of squashing that three sphere, and squashing it in the following way. As you go to infinity, there is this hot vibration dividing by the circle. And now squash it so that the circle becomes of constant length, but the two sphere keeps growing. The two sphere is the sphere you see in R3, it has the normal behavior of a two sphere in R3. But the circle is this asymptotic circle, we want it to settle down to a fixed length. The length will be a certain parameter. That parameter will be the parameter of the deformation. Uh, that parameter, I, well, I've got it right, well, I'm calling it ra the radius of the circle is the inverse of alpha. Uh, so if alpha goes to zero, the circle gets very large, then you're back in the ordinary flat case of the metric, that's the flat metric. So the metric you write down for this one will have a parameter in it. When you put the parameter equal to zero, you'll get the flat metric. When the parameter is non-zero, you get a one parameter deformation of metrics of this type, and they are parameterized by the uh, length of that circle at infinity. Very simple uh, family. So that's very nice. And so the, the, here we have a parameter alpha, which is going to be important to give you the sort of more realistic model of the, of the actual electron. Uh, now, the corresponding thing we're going to do for the proton. Now, the proton already is a more complicated space. It's this, um, I take my proton, this, this CP2 minus RP2, um, and I, I, I got a model for it before, 
which was a particular metric which came from using SU2 monopoles in R3 and using the monopole space. I said, here is a nice example of a self dual manifold, hypercalar manifold with lots of good properties. And it's unique. It's the only one which is SO3 invariant. And it's, you know, God-given. There's no, no, no parameters at all. It's absolutely free, except overall scale. Overall scale is not important. So now, now it, Dancer, was a student United Hitchin, he introduced uh, another four-dimensional manifold. Uh, and he got this in the following way. He went to SU3 and looked at SU3 monopoles. SU3 monopoles are more complicated things. And he, which, when you have a monopole, you, you, at, at infinity, you break it down by the Higgs field, as it's called, and you can break it down... Uh, in SU2, you break it down to, to U1. In SU3, you can break it down to two copies of SU2, uh, or you can break it down to one copy of, of U1 and one copy of SU2. Sorry, you can break it down to two copies of U1 or SU2 and U1. So you break it down to the uh, first, just SU2 across U1, in such a way that the um, quotient of the two is the complex vector plane, by the way. And that, that's the group you break it down to is U2. Then you use the center of U2, a circle, uh, as a moment map to make a hypercalar quotient. The original one you get, the monopole, SU3 monopoles with this sort of reduction with the fixed center are eight dimensional, hypercalar manifold. You make a hypercalar quotient by the circle and you get a four dimensional manifold. Because you're dividing by something which is in the center, you can take the hypercalar quotient by any value of the, in the sort of dual of the Lie algebra of the circle given by the moment map. Usually you take the zero which is always fixed by any symmetry. But here you're free to move away from zero and take another parameter. And that's the parameter you take. So this parameter al alpha, which actually is really a vector in R3, but any rotation will give you, give you the same answer, essentially. Uh, then you, you'll get a parameter which measures the, the an alpha of the parameter is zero, then you get this ordinary you get the original manifold that Hitchin and I described, which we've talked about before. So you deform away from that <laughs> by moving the parameters of the moment map away from zero. And you get a natural geometry, and that has been written down. It's quite complicated. Uh, we know quite a lot about it, but not everything. It's difficult to do computations in some aspects. Um, now, the important thing is the scale of alpha, the length, because I said you can rotate. And that, uh, under, uh, in, in SO3, the, that's another SO3. It's not the same as the SU2. Um, and so this actually is an interesting fact that you have a not only a parameter alpha of length, but a vector in R3. And this one would interpret in terms of the spin of the particle. The particle uh, should have a, can have a spin, and uh, the well, same thing will be true in the case of the electron, I hope. So you'll get, you'll get a, some direction, which is distinguished. Now, the, 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 the manifold that I started off with... Uh, it, Hitching before we did the deformation, and it's still true for all the. It ha, if you look at this behavior at infinity, as ontologically, then uh, it, it looks very much like the tau dot metric of the electron, except for three things. First of all, it has what's called a negative mass parameter. Well, that's the, the parameter in some sense, if you write the formulas down, essentially it's alpha. And instead of, I mean, well, not quite that. There's a parameter which you put into it, and if you take the wrong sign, uh, then you get something which would not. The tab nut thing extends over the whole space. If you change the sign, you can't extend it over the whole space exactly, but you can extend this, this one, because this circle at infinity is not an exact symmetry, only an asymptotic symmetry. In the case of the electron, it's an exact symmetry. You, in the case of the right sign for the electron, you can extend that exact symmetry everywhere. But this one, the symmetry is broken, it only exists at infinity. And that, but you can still extend it inside without getting singularities, because it's not the one you were doing before. So there are two, two differences. It has a different sign, and it has no global symmetry, only asymptotic symmetry. And the third difference is, the one I've already pointed out, is that you have this RP2 at infinity. Instead of the, instead of the three sphere, you have this non-orientability, which gives an extra degree of subtlety. So it's a lot more subtle than the electron. But still, it, it's the same, the same principle of deformation is a deformation parameter that sort of introduces some length of scale. The original thing you have have no scale. R4 has no scale. This manifold we had before had no scale. But this, now we introduce a scale. Now the second parameter, I'll call it beta, uh, 
And this parameter, again, you could apply the same principle to both the leptons and the baryons. Uh, and in the, the, the non-compact models are the limits of the compact ones. Basically, when you, when you have a parameter, and one, well, if you start off with a compact one, immediately when you, you turn on the, sorry, this way around, I think you be careful. I'll tell, you'll see later on. Um, now, the electric charge, yes. The point is that, you should be careful. Um, think of um, something compact, depending on a parameter. And in the limit, it could suddenly become non-compact. Think of the round sphere. And then you, if you make the sphere larger and larger and larger, it approximates more and more to flat space. But it changes its topology. In the limit, the sphere and flat space are different topologies. And the sphere has become non-compact. Same phenomenon happens in these, all these cases. In the limit, the space becomes non-compact. And the compact one depends on a parameter which stretch, changes its shape until it becomes non-compact. So that's important. Now the point is the electric charge uh, only exists for the non-compact ones. So all these compact ones, which depend on a parameter, have no electric charge. Suddenly, they acquire an electric charge. Now, when you think about this first in topology, ge geometrical models, it seems almost a contradiction. You say, on the one hand, you want to define electric charge topologically. Okay? Then you say, I want to make it depend on a continuous parameter. But how can a topological quantity suddenly jump? Okay? Well, I just showed you how it can jump. You, the, change, the, the continuous parameter can change the topology. A sphere can become flat, placed. So in, and the, the, so the, in all these examples, the compact one is the limit of the wrong compact ones, and it suddenly it, it can acquire an electric charge, whereas the compact ones have no electric charge. <coughs> um, well, now, it, now the, this parameter, where did it come from? I haven't, I've just told you there is a parameter, but where did it come from? Well, it comes from the following. If you think of some of these models, this model of M, we talked about, this M02, as magnetic monopoles, they come from magnetic monopoles in flat R3. But you can introduce magnetic monopoles in hyperbolic three space. The curvature of hyperbolic three space now gives you another parameter. They're called beta. Or I written it as minus beta squared to emphasize that it's a negative curvature. And this parameter beta is a parameter which... Uh, when beta goes to zero, it gives you flat space, and otherwise it gives you curved space. Uh, so the curved space is, and this is the parameter uh, which you can apply in, in both the electron model and the proton model can be interpreted in, in terms of monopole story. The proton actually comes from non-abelian monopoles, the electron comes from abelian monopoles, but in both cases you can have this hyperbolic uh, parameter. And they've been studied by different people. There's a lot of literature on this. I'm just telling you results. Uh, in particular, in the case of this manifold M02, I call it, this parameter beta, if, if you take certain, well, has been studied by Nigel Hitchin, and in particular, he, if a certain in, integral sequence, when the uh, twice beta inverse is in, integral, he has found explicit self dual Einstein metrics of positive scalar curvature on, well, you start off with. Uh, non-compact manifold, which is, well, let's say the four sphere I started off with, minus RP2, that in that space you can, uh, that, you can write down the differential equation to study solution to Einstein equations, and you find a whole fa one parameter family, and particular integer values is a rather simple form. And the first one you get in that family is the four sphere, the second one is the double covering is CP2, and all the other ones are defined on CP2, and they look singular along RP2, but they're actually conical shaped. I'll, I'll say a bit more about that. For those of you who are interested in the analysis, this is related to the panel of A6 equation. The exact, you get exact solutions of these things um, by going to that, that equation and do, doing the calculations. Now, so the, here I'm saying, well, just repeat it now, all the manifolds of uh, depending on this beta parameter that starts off with R4 minus RP2 or the double covering CP2, uh, they're all defined on the same manifold. It's an open manifold. But uh, these metrics you get this way are not complete. Usually we want to complete metric. When you complete the metric, it extends over the paste thing we removed, RP2. And in the first case, it extends to give you the round metric of the fourth sphere. 
That's for the value of beta equal to half. For beta equal to one, it extends over the RP2, but it's uh, on one, up, the one on the left-hand side, so to speak, it, over that one, but it's branched. But take the double branch covering, you get a CP2, then it straightens itself out, and we have a nice metric on CP2. It is the standard metric on CP2. So these are the two standard metrics which are, <coughs> you like. And then if beta is integer greater than or equal to 2, then all you always get is a metric on CP2, which along RP2 has a conical behavior. The, con the conical behavior is uh, so rational, given by a rational angle, depending on beta, and <coughs> it's technically not a manifold because it has a kind of cone, it has a cone behavior. Uh, if you wanted a manifold which had all these other properties, you would only find the first two that was known. But if you allow a manifold of this kind, then it, it's okay. So there is a, these are all, if you allow this minus singularity, these you get a family of um, uh, self-dual uh, Einstein metrics. But they're metrics of positive curvature, positive scalar curvature. Whereas the one we started from, which is before you introduce this parameter beta, that is zero scalar curvature. And the, all these other ones, which are compact, they have positive scalar curvature. Typically, the plane has flat curvature, the sphere has a positive curvature. So these are all like spheres, so to speak. Uh, so that's what you do with the, with the baryons. For the leptons, you do the same thing. It's, you use the hyperbolic analog of the taubnut, and these can be done, and this is work by Lebrun. You can write down uh, metrics which depend on parameters which essentially come from hyperbolic space. These are not actually Einstein manifolds, but they're self-dual manifolds, this time of uh, self-dual Kähler manifolds, scalar curvature zero. That's, I won't go into the details, but very, very, there are a good class of manifolds which is well to say. I don't know too much about what we should think about the neutrino. The neutrino is such as, you start off with just a sphere, sphere. It has no charge, there's no barrier number. It has nothing really. It's a very poor relative. Um, and uh, I'm not quite sure what, whether, whether you, what you can do with it here, but... Uh, Let's leave that aside for the, for the moment. Now, let me say a bit more about these ones here. Well, first of all, this parameter beta, uh, it is, it, it is geometrical meaning is it corresponds to the curvature of hyperbolic space. And you're parameterizing some solutions and some equations there, and there's no reason for this parameter to have integer values. If it's integer values, then you get simple solutions. Uh, and the geometry is simple, but if the parameter is not of integer values, the solution should, it should really be thought of as a real parameter, and the certain integer points, it becomes simple. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you some picture about that in a moment. So don't, uh, and in that case, you can write it down, in the, and it corresponds to the fact that the solution to the panel of A equation, for those particular values, uh, can be written down as algebraic functions, whereas for the general value, it certainly will be transcendental. So let me say something now. Uh, now, this is that, so far as geometry. I, you can't argue with geometry. It's a bit of mathematics, I can tell you. Do the work, you get the manifold, you get the parameters. That's okay. Now, now physics. We speculate. These were meant to be models for electrons, protons, and so on. What is the meaning, if there is a meaning, if the model is on the right track of these parameters? Well, let me stick my neck out, as they say. Physical meaning of the parameter alpha beta. First of all, what is the meaning of alpha? Uh, I suggest the meaning of alpha is, is, is an en to do with energy, energy scale. Energy scale, any mass, mass scale, if you like, as well. Alpha, now, depending on how you normalize, alpha equals zero is the one which we started with, is the flat space, is the extreme, I will call the extremely high energy limit. And that was what physicists would call the grand unification scale, where everything looks the same. That's the one which had maximal symmetry. But we've broken the symmetry, and as we increase alpha, we get, we get further away from the symmetrical situation and you get more into the real world. And if you think of it in the physicist language, what happens is that the different forces start to have different strengths, and the masses are appearing. So energy, energy scale, which determines the actual metrics and so on, is very important for the physics, and this is a parameter which turns on uh, energy scaling, starting off with a situation where there was no... Everything was totally symmetrical. The world, uh, God created it, was just one nice big round fluffy ball. So uh, now you turn it on and it starts to change its shape. So it's a very important parameter. And this pr parameter looks as though it has that sort of thing. Second parameter, well, then beta. What is the value of meaning of beta? Well, I want to propose that it's, this is related to Planck's constant. 
uh, roughly from Planck's constant. Beta going to zero will be the classical limit. So the one we start off with is the classical limit, and B greater than zero will be in the quantum regime. The size, the size of beta will be related to the physical value of Planck's constant in the right units. Now, in our model, we got this from the curvature of hyperbolic space, but that's in some other situation from which you make these manifolds. Um, this um, interpretation of, of Planck's constants coming, coming out in relation to some geometrical scale, like the curvature of hyperbolic space, uh, is actually reminiscent of what happens in M theory. M theory is, your know, string theory is supposed to take place in 10 dimensions. M theory took place in 11 dimensions. And they even talk about 12. But in, M, in 11, M theory, you go from um, 11, 10 dimension to 10 by adding another circle, so to speak. And the size of that circle in the physical model is meant to be Planck's constant. So when you go to M theory, Planck's constant becomes part of the geometry. So you combine quantum theory with geometry at that stage in M theory. That's certainly the case. If you look at the formulas, it's certainly true. Well, I'm proposing a similar proposal here. In this geometrical model, there is this parameter, and I will think of it as playing the role of Planck's constant. And deforming away from zero to zero is going between the classical limit and the quantum regime. So we start off with the very symmetrical situation. We start off with B equal to zero. We start off with classical physics. If we turn on the parameter, we make it quantum. How much we make it will depend, of course, on the value you assign to this parameter in the right physical units, and that which will be Planck's constant. Uh, but that doesn't make sense to do that in geometry because we haven't put in any physical units here yet. So that's the arrangement. Well, these are obviously two very important um, parameters in physics. Energy scale. Energy, by the way, is also related to time. Uh, if, so uh, the, the, these are beginning to be very important uh, parameters. So having them is... is, is and they're natural. The, from the geometry, they exist. And they work both for the leptons and for the barons. So that's fine. Now, let me digress to say something which I didn't mention before, and it's a bit of an afterthought, my notes here, <coughs> but it's about something called isospin. <coughs> now, isospin um, is something which in physics is the, people have observed that the proton and the neutron are very similar. They have a little difference in mass. One of them is charged and the other is not charged. If you forget that, then they look as though there are two pairs of a doublet and there should be two, a two-dimensional space these correspond to different states in that space. So they are, either spin is meant to be the sort of rotation in that two-dimensional complex space, by S, an SU2 group, which uh, exhibits the symmetry between proton and neutron. But of course that symmetry is not exact. Masses of the particles are different. One is charged and the other is not charged. So it's only an approximate symmetry. And so one of the problems in physics, is, or if you like, is to get a good understanding of either spin, is to understand this approximate symmetry. Where does it come from? How do you use it? And so on. So how will it come up in these models? Well, we start off with, a, I'm thinking now of the, the case of the baryon, the, the proton, if you like. We, we start off with a metric, metric which is hyperkalometric. Now, around a hyperkaler manifold is a manifold where the tangent space has a quaternionic structure, a rigid, rigid quaternionic structure. You can multiply by i, j, and k in a covariant constant way. Another way of saying that is that the holonomy of the manifold is in SU2 instead of being in SO4. SO4 has two copies of SU2 corresponding to the self-dual and anti-self-dual story. And in the hypercanning manifold, one of them is trivial. The, that actually is a trivial bundle. That S, the corresponding SU2, the two-dimensional space on which SU2 acts, which is one of the two spin spaces, is actually covariant constant. And so that one has the exact symmetries that you would have uh, on SU2. Uh, that would be exact isospin. So a hyperkähler manifold would be exhibit exact isospin. So if we didn't deform away our prototype, we would have exact isospin, and the two states would be interpreted as quantum mechanically as the proton and the neutron. But we did turn on a parameter. We turned on this parameter beta, which I told you was to be thought of as the quantum effect. And this immediately breaks that symmetry. And the metrics you get, the metrics that Hitchin described, are not hyperkähler, because although they're self-dual, and Einstein, they have positive scalar curvature. Uh, Hyperkähler magnet has zero scalar curvature. So the, the, the scalar curvature is a positive number that depends on beta. And there's a simple formula uh, for if, if, when beta is t t when twice two beta inverse is an integer, 
and you call it integer k, then the formula is something like the scalar curvature of the four manifold is twice the tangent squared of pi over k. So th these are positive, um, and therefore they, you've broken the hyperkähler. So, and therefore you've broken exact isospin. And now exactly the neutron and the proton are got separated by a sort of quantum effect. And this is the same time at which our manifold has become co you know, compact. So we, we, we've got rid of the charge. So we, we, this, this deformation uh, sort of be, gets rid of the charge for the neutron and it distinguishes the uh, proton from the neutron in terms of the breaking of either spin. Uh, and of course, the other parameter, alpha, was supposed to give you energy and masses. And you put the two, these two parameters, by the way, can be combined. I should have emphasized that. They're not alternatives. You do them both. You do both alpha and beta. And they essentially you know, come together. You can pair them off. So if you do both of those, then you will c c convert the proton into another object, the neutron, which is a slightly different mass and uh, which has no charge. So the breaking of either spin it has exactly the right physical properties. And it comes very naturally because of the geometry does it for you. You don't need to think. I mean, you just look and see what the geometry tells you, and the model has done it for you, even before you ask the question. That's very satisfactory. Um, here I've written some questions. The fact that this, uh, there is this quantization condition, or integrality condition on beta, would give you especially interesting solutions. Uh, you might say that's just because we want, we like, want like nice solutions, but you also ask, perhaps it's related to some um, physical property. Now, the geometry, uh, well, it might be related to when you have a, a, this deformation, you get a, a, a Kähler class. Um, in the hyperkähler case, you have sort of three choices of Kähler class and complex structure, all of which can be rotated among themselves by SO3. When you break the symmetry, uh, you only get one of those. And uh, as you know, in Kähler geometry, uh, Kähler class can be a, is a differential, which sometimes is, represents an integral class. And then it corresponds to an algebraic variety, Hodge theory. Uh, and so there'll be certain integer values which, which quantize that. Or that so. And it's possible, although I haven't looked into it, that uh, this quantization is related to giving sort of the integer values to this Kähler class. That's what I've written much more thought. I only thought about this five minutes ago. Um, and there's another way the integrality might come in. I haven't said anything yet about the zyberg witten equations. If I have time, I'll come back to them. But in the zyberg witten equations, which is rather an important part of the story, there is a certain line bundle and that line bundle requires integrality, and that line bundle again might be related to this story. So there are lots of places where that integer property may be um, useful, but at the moment I don't really know. Now somewhere I thought I had a little picture which I seem to have lost about uh, explaining to you what happens with... Oh yes, here it is, it's out of place. But, well, let's maybe... Uh, Let me give it to you while I'm here. Going back to the Hitchin manifolds, I told you that the metric you get on CP2 has an orbifold, well, it has a singularity along RP2, which you call an orbifold singularity. In other words, it's a singularity, you can go to a finite covering, it'll be smooth, and then you divide by a certain cyclic group, and the quotient below has, gets this conical singularity. So it's a singularity arising from a quotient. An orbifold singularity that will be much used in geometry, quite often with isolated points, but this is a co-dimension 2 case, it's easier. Because in co-dimension two, well, all you need to look at is what happens in the normal direction. The normal direction is two-dimensional, and that's very familiar. If you take the complex numbers and you divide by a cyclic group, you get an ordinary branch covering in the complex plane. You make the substitution w equals z to the nth, and the uh, invariant functions are functions of, of w. So in complex variable theory, you don't really think of a branch point below as being a singular point. It's an ordinary good point of the complex space below. But if you would think of these things, uh, uh, and so the complex structure goes down under cyclic covering. But the real structure, the metric structure, does not. Think of R2 as real now, with a rigid metric. Think of the flat plane. And now, uh, when you divide by a cyclic group of order n, the quotient you get is a cone with an angle depending on n. So, for example, if n is 4, then you think of the covering space as fourfold covering. You divide it into four quadrangles, you take the piece of paper and you cut out the left-hand corner, throw away the rest, fold those two edges together, and you get a cone whose angle you can see from that picture. And that's, 
that you can do whenever you divide by cyclic group or order n, and n is an integer. So you'll get cones like that. Those cones are metrical cones. So if you form the quotient as a metric space, you get this picture. And here, all we've got to think of is the normal direction, the RP2. If we add RP2, we simply move along the RP2, along the, along the vertex. In the normal direction, it's conical. But if you sort of use other coordinates, thinking of it complex, it would be smooth manifold. So it's a matter of opinion whether you think of this as a manifold with, in complex variable theory with a branch locus or a metric space with a cone. Emphasizing the metric, you get the singularity. Emphasizing the complex structure, you'd get, you uh, wouldn't have a singularity. And this only works, of course, if this I number beta is of the form with, uh, related to an integer value, where, where the angle is 2 pi over beta. But you can also, of course, imagine cones of any angle. They don't come from a finite covering, but the cone is well defined. You can just take a piece of paper, take any angle you write, form the cone. So there is a natural family of geometries which have an angle of cone which has a continuous variable. Only that in the case for integer values, you can express that in terms of finite quotient and use the word orbifold. But why? Why stick to that? So the geometry, geometry perfectly well allows for all real values of the parameter. The, the formula will be more difficult, but there's no reason to believe that it ha has to be there. So think of this as a real parameter, which you make this deformation, and the, the quotient spaces have this conical kind of behavior. And so they're all really compact manifolds, you know, if you allow that kind of minor variation in the behavior. Now, let me go back and say a little bit about um, something I didn't mention before, the, the Dirac equation. Uh, the Dirac equation is, of course, um, very important, and it's one of the first steps in developing quantum theory. Um, now, if you take the Dirac equation, stress equation for spinners on a manifold, and let's suppose the manifold is compact, then if the scalar curvature is positive, then the famous theorem of Lichnerovich saying there are no solution of the Dirac equation. Uh, no, but it, and if the strong, but another version of that is that if the scalar curvature is equal to zero, then the only solutions are covariant constant. Okay? Now, a hypercalar manifold is one where the scalar curvature is zero. And so then, if you, then you will have covariant constant spinners. Uh, and that's related to the, the isospin I mentioned before, the covariant constant uh, part of the story. But when you make these deformations by this parameter beta, then you introduce the scalar curvature becomes positive, as I told you. Then you kill the, the solution of the Dirac equation. It disappears. It's not there. So when you make this deformation from the non going if you think of the comp start with the non-compact ones, where you have spinners which satisfy this equation, and you go to the move it a little bit, immediately it closes up and becomes compact, immediately you've lost that spinner. That's the solution of the equation. That's a very important fact. That, again, how can you make topological change that things jump discontinuously? Well, an eigenvalue problem is discontinuous. It can suddenly be zero when it wasn't zero before. But it's related to the compactness or non-compactness of the manifold. You see, so the two points of view about the electric charge coming with the non-compact ones and disappearing in the compact one is tied up with this story because electric charge and the solution of the Dirac equation are closely linked. Um, so I've just set, set, set that all here. So this, fit, this story fits with electric charge disappearing when you go to the neutron model. It also fits with zyberg witten theory, which again, I, haven't, I hope to come back to for the end. In zyberg witten theory, the Dirac equation is part of the equations. The equations, Zyberg are two equations. One is the Dirac equation, and the other is another, another equation. And so this story, if you do the zyberg witten theory, you would automatically be looking at solutions of the Dirac equation. And this is very important. The, the scalar curvature turning from a zero to positive a very important part. Now, here I mentioned before, briefly, uh, the uh, Hawking, Gibbon, and Anzac, which I'll now tell you a bit more about. Uh, if you take a uh, uh, function like this, out v is equal to alpha constant, our friend, plus 1 over r, this is in three space, r is the distance to the origin, and then you uh, do the following, you consider, a con con geometrical term, a connection form for a u1 bundle over r3, omega the connection form, one form, and you write down this differential equation, d omega equals star dv. That actually is the abelian Bagumanli equation. We, we wrote it down before for SU2 things. This is just for U1 things. From that, you can construct a metric on a four-dimensional manifold, uh, and the metric is written there, or at least uh, the, the, you take h of the Euclidean metric on R3, you multiply it by this function v, and then you write omega squared, which is the square of this one form there, 
with v to the minus 1. And this is a metric on a four-dimensional manifold, which is the circle bundle over the R3, and it's a hyperkähler metric. That's the Hawking-Gibbons construction. And it, for them, it describes what they call a gravitational instanton. But we're using it for other purposes. So the, uh, that's the, the, the simplest example of a hyperkähler metric given by this ANSATS. Now, uh, the tau nut parameter, tau deformation with parameter alpha, comes by this construction. Exactly. If you put this construction, I see what you get is the tau nut deformation of R4, our first deformation. But while I'm about it, you can point out that there are what are called multi tab nuts. You can take any number of points in R3, and you write down the function V, which is said to be the potential due to sources at the different points R1 to Rk, with a constant front. <coughs> Here I call it M, doesn't matter. Uh, and you use the same formula. Then you get, again, a nice hyperkalometric on a uh, four dimensional manifold, which Hawking and Gibbons call a, mu a multi gravitation, gravitation instant with larger instant number. And, the, and these are much studied. And so these are what you would get by trying to think of putting many electrons together, in some sense, in my model. But I didn't pursue that. But what's more important for us is that in this geometry, you can just immediately replace Euclidean space by hyperbolic space. In fact, you can put any uh, manifold below. If you put down hyperbolic space and write the same formula, all you need to do is to replace the function 1 over r by the Green's function of the hyperbolic Laplacian. I mean, 1 over r is the Newtonian Green's function. Uh, 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 any manifold has a corresponding Green's function, constant curvature metric, the Green's function. Green's function in the hyperbolic space is a rather simple function, originally down there. It's not 1 over r, but it's 1 over exponential of 2 rho, where rho is the hyperbolic distance, minus 1. So that begins in its expansion, so to speak, really with, with uh, rho, or oh, two, 2 rho. So, so this is the Green's function for hyperbolic space. If you plug that formula in there, you get a corresponding manifold. That's the hyperbolic analog of these other metrics I described here, which would be what I would do to deform the model for the electron. And that's the one studied by Lebrun, and you, know, you can do a lot more work with them. They're very nice manifolds, but these, what I'm trying to emphasize is that this deformation, by using this parameter, hyperbolic space, is a very natural one. Now, if you have a hyperkähler manifold, uh, then it has three complex structures. If you took a basis, i, j, and k, uh, and uh, if you pick one of them, then you get a nice complex variety manifold. And if you're lucky, it might even be algebraic. So the answer is that this manifold, M02, that I wrote down, is actually an algebraic surface. And there's this equation. It's very simple. I mean, it's x cubic equation. Equation is E3 in three variables. That is the... Uh, and now the deformation you get by the alpha def the answer deformation is also a simple equation. There it is. You just add to the one, you add I alpha Y. So and I want to emphasize that the whole point about this twister theory is it does enable you to really write down simple equations that describe these rather complicated metrics. To get the actual metric, you need a bit more work. You need to describe not just the surface equation, which is writing using one complex structure, but somehow you've got to use all complex structures. And, that, and you do that by going to the twisted space. The twisted space is that it encodes all the information uh, how the rotation group acts in connection with this equation. And you can do it, write down a nice three-dimensional variety, also given essentially by simple equations. And then again, you can do that with the deformation. So twisted theory really does a very effective and beautifully simple and the answers are not complicated in this formulation. You know, it's pretty easy to write, write down an equation like that. So, uh, the Twister theory does give you nice algebraic answers in these formulae. Uh, so it's <clears throat> now, the next topic I should say something about, now we're running out of time, so I'll, fortunately I don't know the answers, so I can all do answer, answer questions. Quarks. Now, standard physics says that protons and neutrons are not elementary in some sense. They are made up of smaller things called quarks. And there are three quarks in each proton and three quarks in a neutron, but they're slightly different quarks. Uh, there, are three kinds of, there are two kinds of quarks, up quarks and down quarks. And uh, if you put two of one and one of the other, one, one of them gives you the proton and one of them gives you the neutron. So they're very similar in interchanging the roles of the up and down quarks. Um, and this, this theory is meant to be based on the uh, strong interaction theory, SU3 gauge theory. Well, I'm not doing gauge theory, I'm doing geometry, but I did use SU3, 
that was the dance of deformation. And the dance of deformation was the one that produces these energy, these masses, and it breaks the exosymmetry, uh, and it, it does, well, it, it changes the geometry of this. The original manifold was at fully SO3 invariance. And so, for example, at its core, there was a two-dimensional sphere. Very far away, you, asymptotically, you had a real picture plane. And SO3 acts on the two-sphere, for example, keeping it around two-sphere. And you deform the metric, things change. And you lose the SO3 rotation, you still have a U1 rotation. So this sphere will deform, and probably, I don't know, conjecture is it will remain an ellipsoid. And then the ellipsoid will have axes, whose lengths are a parameter, and so it's reasonable to think that those might be related to the two of them, though, because it's actually symmetric, the two of them are equal, and there is a third one. And that, that, those should be related to the geometry of the quarks. This is sort of obvious, sort of kind of guess. If you look and see if this model of geometry is any good, then you should be able to see the quarks. You should be able to see them geometrically, in some sense, in the geometry. Now, you, the geometry has many bits of information, one of which is so the, 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 the shape of this core. The core is the thing right at the heart of the proton. And what shape it is, it's ellipsoid, what length, that obviously an important factor. The other thing you can do is to look asymptotically. If you're from outside, you see the asymptotic regime. Asymptotically, what does it look like? And now you can write down the asymptotic form of the metric. The asymptotic form of the metric is known. Now, the, in the taub nut metric, uh, I, I, that, that's a very easy one. Very, we can write down the metric there. It looks like a circle. And the multi taub nut, you can do it with many points, as I mentioned before. So now you can, do, you can write down what would be asymptotically the tau dot metric due to three points uh, in which you take two of them with the right sign and one of them with the wrong sign, so to speak. Uh, I try to indicate that below. And that form, that gives you exactly the asymptotic form of this dancer metric. And the three points, that you think of them as symmetrically placed along a line and the distance apart is the parameter alpha, and the rotation, the line might be in three space, it gives you an orientation, and the two of them are equal, and one of them is different. The two are, on the edge are equal, and if they collided, if you make the, if alpha, the parameter goes to zero, then the three points co coincide, then you have two minuses and a plus, you end up with one sign, you end up with the ordinary uh, tau nut metric. So this is a very natural deformation, and you see three things, and the three things have a parameter, which is the deformation parameter alpha, so in some sense you might think of these three things as being um, kind of the outward manifestation of the quarks. But, I mean, you know, this is a language of, it's sort of uh, I'm just saying there are strong hints of what the quarks are, but it needs more thought. But they're certainly, they arise, they arise naturally from SU3, which is meant to be the, th the gauge group you're thinking about, and um, you know, they have roughly sort of properties that you might uh, hope to expect. There's an interesting question which I have only vaguely thought about. Why, when you go from uh, the proton to the neutron, do the quarks switch? Why do the up quark and down quark switch? Well, I've got a rough idea. Maybe not right. You see, um, originally we had, in, when you go back to the fourth sphere, we had two copies of RP2, one in the, sorry, the origin and one at infinity. And we singled out the one at infinity and sort of banished it, cut it off, and we made non-compact manifolds. But then when we go back to the neutron, we close things up again. So infinity comes back into the picture. Now, the two RP2s are really sort of opposite ends of the story, and their axes will switch at a certain funny symmetry. And so I suspect, if, it, if this is on the right track, the reason the up and down clock switch is because there's a symmetry between zero and infinity in the geometry, and you get in converted. So that's a sort of rough... In other words, the, put another way around, the, the, these ellipsoids I talked about, one of them is at the core, and the other is asymptotic. And in the... Proton, you, 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 you can't, the asymptotic one isn't really there, but in the neutron, it really is there. And you, somehow, you now de, if you now decide that's the one you want, then you'd see that there will be switch up and down. Well, that's a bit obviously speculative, but uh, now I finished really, and uh, I have left here um, the bits about the Zyber Witten equations, which I would have said, but there isn't really time. This important subject, all I should say about it is that the Zyber Witten equations as I mentioned before, are an alternative approach to Donaldson theory, so they give very deep results on geometry. But they also have a very natural sort of physical meaning because they're about spinners, the Dirac equation, and the electromagnetic field, and the interesting nonlinear interaction. So they're closer to the physics, 
and uh, they, they fit nicely into this geometry. And <coughs> I would propose in a next, next refined model of this picture to define a baryon, neutron, or rather the, bar the, bar the protons, uh, or the higher particles, as cell dual manifold of this type, together with a solution of these Ivergwitten equations. That will incorporate the solution of the Drac equation and begin to take a first step in a kind of quantum direction. That's, I think, what, the, what it ought to be, and there are lots of good reasons for that. So let me finish instead by, I've already mentioned, of course, a lot of problems, lots of things I said, need more thought, need more thought, need more thought. You know, now here is a long list of other questions, further developments. Where do we go from here? Well, first thing I just mentioned just now, we should use the Zyber-Gwitten equation, the left out with an N, uh, uh, to consist of a manifold together with the solution of the Zyber-Gwitten equation. It includes the solution. That's what I just said. Secondly, we should start to study higher baryon numbers. I mean, I talked here all about the proton, the neutron, but you want to talk about baryon number two, three, four, etc. the whole periodic cable, uh, and protons and neutrons t together. So we want to study a higher baryon number, and the first interesting one probably would be helium, which is uh, baryon number four, two neutrons, two protons. Uh, and uh, the question would be to look, that we know from physics that that's a very stable uh, nucleus. And so you would hope that the corresponding uh, metric manifold would have, have some stability properties. Uh, by the way, just on a side, there is, there is nowadays a theory of stability for algebraic varieties which is being developed and it's quite close to some of the questions in here. And so the question of stability, which is obviously a very important issue in everything, uh, will come, come into the geometry and might come into the physics. And if this model is on the right track, the helium nucleus should be a very good example of a really good, stable uh, manifold in some sense. Then we come on to the question of fission fusion. As I mentioned before, if you have a lot of, lot of baryons, they can pull apart, you can cut them apart, or you can stick them together. I said that there was this theorem that you can stick together cell dual manifolds under some conditions. So that's what you would have to do there and study it in detail. Then we come on to the question of dynamics. So far, I've talked about everything as being static. I didn't bring in time. I kept it away. If you bring in time, then you've got to write down what are the equations of motion, how will it evolve. Uh, but my idea is that the evolution of the actual... We should always try to keep this property of there being self dual manifolds. So when they evolve... They have to evolve, changing their shape internally. And if they have many baryons in them, they'll have many parameters in their moduli. The modulus, moduli of these self dual manifolds will usually be multidimensional. And taking a path in there would deform the sort of nucleus in some particular way. And if you go to the limit, when you go to the edge of the moduli space, it could break up into bits. So studying the... Uh, this is not necessarily the dynamics. It would be kind of studying the sort of kinematics still the possible ways in which the thing can move, how it can deform, and how it can break apart. And then the, getting related to the actual dynamic, you'd have to work out what the equations of motion were, and that's obviously even further away. Uh, so that's five. But well, this is the big question, you know, you know. How to relate this to standard physics? Quantum mechanics, string theory, general relativity, you name it. Uh, well, I've hinted already at some relations to quantum mechanics. There are lots of links between this and strings, things that model in string theory, because the things I've used, these moduli spaces, come into different models of string theory. It, I've just used a little piece of what the string theorists use, and so it's quite likely that this theory, if pushed along, will simply get swallowed up in string theory, and the string theorists will say, ah, we knew this all the time, or this and this. But I come with a particular point of view, which may be helpful. But anyway, and gravity eventually is aim of string theory is to incorporate gravity. I've taken a geometrical point of view from the beginning, which is fitting in with the philosophy of gravity, so perhaps I come in from an angle which is friendly for gravity. And lastly, make predictions. And first of all, you should make these qualitative predictions, how things break up, and then eventually quantitative predictions. For example, let's take a qualitative prediction. If you take a, a, a neutron then, if I'm, the physicist will correct me, there's something called beta decay, where the th thing can decompose, and it can produce a, a proton, an electron, whose charge is cancelled, but it can also produce a neutrino. Is that right? Okay, so, if this is true, if, if this model is correct, 
We know we have models for protons, we have models for neutrons, we have models for the electrons, neutrino. So we know that the kind of deformation we're allowed to use, which is to keep the complex structure almost the um, work in the twisted space, if you like, keep the uh, self dual structure. We want to find a way of moving in the, in the parameters of the space so that at the limit edge points, things break up in the way the physics describes. And this is like, very much like an algebraic geometry. You take an algebraic curve, and you go to the boundary of modular space, it decomposes, it breaks up. A cubic curve can break up into a line and the, and the conic, or it can break up into three lines. Those kind of decompositions are what you might be able to deduce just from looking at the algebraic geometry of these Switzer spaces. And then, uh, you, so that would be a quality, well, that's not a prediction, that's fitting in with, but you would be able to produce in this model the kind of behavior which we know happens. So that will, now, without any numbers, without saying how much energy is lost and all, that will come from the next stage. But before you get to the stage of giving numbers, you can describe the qualitative behavior. To say that a, a neutron can de decay into <coughs> a proton, electron, and neutrino is a qualitative statement. And, you know, I haven't said any numbers, but I made a, a physical prediction of some kind. And you can do an experiment and see. So it, it's possible in this, in this theory to imagine making that and other. You know, there'll be other examples of um, decay or um, interactions which physicists know about, and you can see to what extent they can be modelled here. Well, anyway, there's a long list of problems, as you see, and uh, I'm happy to have any, any help from any quarter, uh, whether you're a physicist, a mathematician, professor, or a graduate student, you know, any help gratefully received, uh, acknowledged, uh, you can be rewarded with a share of or a champagne <laughs> bottle, <laughs> whatever you like. So, uh, it, but it, it, there's no shortage of questions. It, it's a little bit embarrassing how many questions you can ask because, you know, if you try to get a new way of doing physics, well, you're, you're starting at the beginning and you've got this vast uh, uh, whole apparatus worked out over the last hundred years. So there's no shortage of, of, of uh, questions and no shortage of things which you can actually compare with experiment in a way. Uh, when I talked with Nick Manton, who my advi help, helps me on these things, he, he, he said, well, you see, in string theory, the difficulty is to find something which will make an predi experimental prediction. It deals with such high energies that nobody can do an experiment of this kind. It's very difficult to see how you can test string theory experimentally. But if you have a new model for nuclear physics, there's no shortage of experiments. <laughs> there's a vast amount of data out there already. The difficulty is there's too much. You know, you, you'll have difficulty fitting a model that matches all these in advance. If you know the results, you try to, you know, f sort the model out to fit it, okay. But if you want to produce a, a, a priori model and go out into the wide world and face all the guys who've done experiments on nuclear physics, you've got vast number of constraints. So, you know, the, the things you've got to satisfy are infinitely more difficult than what string theorists have to face. So I'm really <laughs> sticking my neck out here in a big way. But I don't make precise predictions. These are only meant to be qualitative predictions. And anyway, that's the model. If, you know, it's my toy. If the model doesn't work, I put it back in the box and get another toy out. Okay, thank you. <laughs> or answers? Yeah. Michael, maybe yeah. you have already uh, talked about that already, but you know, yeah. my math is really at a low level, so I may not be able to capture it. <laughs> What you have said. Is there an easy way to understand, say, for example, why light charges attract and uh, repel and opposite yeah, charges? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, light, light charges repel and, and why should they go through a, a, a determinant by a 1 over r squared law? And in particular, it just happened that when Mars interact with each other, they also have a 1 over r squared law. Yeah. So if this 1 over r to the power 2, is that true? Any metric coming from geometry or, or. I think, you know, already Newton knew, I think, this. I mean, the one over R squared is related to the dimensionality in, in a unique way. In other dimensions, you have different formulas and it's second order equations. So I think it's a universal. And if you have a geometrical model, it has to reproduce the same behavior to be, uh, geomet geometrically, like the solutions of the Laplace equations. Uh, so these are very stable uh, facts. And I think the, the business about uh, the electrical forces repelling and trying will be built into the geometry of these spaces. I mean, it'll. it'll I don't, think any, don't see any difficulty with that. I didn't say anything about it, but uh, it would uh, um, almost inevitably be tied up in any good geometrical model. Um, but you're right. I, mean, I should put that onto the list of things to check. You know, explain why electrons <laughs> repel each other. I gave you a picture of... Uh, well, let's, let's be more precise. 
I gave you a model which said, here is a, a, a multi-electron. Put electrons in different places. Here is the manifold that corresponds to that. Now, uh, now if they're going to mo move, they should be moving in the moduli space of that system. The thing that parameterizes these metrics. So you look at the space that parameterizes these metrics, which is well known, in fact, and it's hyper, and you you want to follow the path that would correspond to the electrons interacting. And since they repel each other, they should be going away. So you should be going one direction rather than the other one. Uh, and obviously, because we haven't talked about the dynamics at all yet, but if, the very first thing you'd have to do, either going to the dynamics, would be to you know, give a direction of going forward rather than backwards in time. You know, <laughs> what well, things go forward in time, they repel. If you went backwards in time, they would attract. So you have to already um, write down some fundamental law, but you would see, have a model in which you could follow that through. So then I think it would be the easiest one to do, of course, because uh, behavior of electrons under repulsion is the first law of, of element particles before you get to anything complicated. Was, those are the simplest manifolds here, and that would be e easy to check once you know what the laws are that are supposed to govern. But it also, it would give you a hint how to write down you know, what kind of laws. But it's a good, I said, it's a very good natural question. I was talking about the theory should be dealing with much more complicated things, how do baryons interact and so on. But it must include also how electrons interact with themselves, and also the electromagnetic energy between electrons and protons has to be part of the story. Uh, but you gradually make it more complicated. But the very first thing certainly is to produce the ordinary Coulomb force from this, and uh, the very first requirement of any dynamical theory has to be that. Does that mean physicists like uh, Riemannian geometry much better than Fensler geometry? Well, you know, Chern liked Fensler geometry at the end of his life. He wrote a book about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've, I've never really looked at Fensler geometry. I mean, I'm prepared to believe that it's, it's interesting geometry, and maybe, maybe it's necessary. But Riemannian geometry is a very rich subject, which has had an enormous amount of uh, history and development on it from... Riemann to the present time, and it has an enormous impact in, in algebraic geometry and other areas. We know a lot about it. I'm reluctant to sort of move away from that f field to something more complicated unless I'm forced to for some reason. Maybe, maybe it's true. And I, I don't really didn't look in Finza geometry in general. But the Riemannian, ordinary Riemannian geometry is a very, very you know, rich subject which is tremendous, which has been studied by you know, centuries. And we know a lot about it, and it has very lot of deep theorems, you know, black holes and all. I mean, the, ge the curvature probably are really quite fantastic. So I think it's it's quite complicated enough in order to explain physics. I hope hope we don't need to go into the, the geometry, but if it, you know, <laughs> we leave it to the next generation, if necessary. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm yeah. So, what's the top knot metric in? Well, it's the metric I remember this wrote down. It's the one where you, you take a, number, a point, you take a constant plus 1 over r, origin, and you write, call that function v, and you write down uh, v times the Riemannian metric in R3 plus v inverse times the square of the connection form for this uh, line bundle, and you, you can spit it all out, and that's the metric or a four manifold, and that's the type of metric, and the parameter is a constant um, term. If you and you can do that with many points, then you get the multi type knots. But with one point, you get ordinary type knot. If the parameter goes to zero, all you're doing is writing down the Euclidean metric in four space in terms of three dimensional coordinates. Like it's very cool, you know. Take R four, think of it as d divided by the phase rotation of C two. You, so you, you try to describe a point in four space by a point in R three and a point on the circle. Write down the Euclidean metric in those coordinates for me. Good exercise. You'll find this formula without the constant term. You put the constant term in, you get tau of nut. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very beautiful, simple formula for the metric and uh, has been known for a long time. It's one of the earliest ones, examples known. And it has this nice shape. You, you, sort of, you think of the space, you start off with R4, you curve R4 around the center, source, and then you get a kind of sphere that I can make a... a I can't draw in enough dimensions, but the, the part, the dimensions that count, is look like a bottle after a while, going off with a unit circle. Except that you, underneath the circle, you have to add a two sphere, which grows um, in the ordinary space. But the so at, at infinity, it looks like a squashed three sphere, 
where the circle is a fixed size and the tooth sphere is growing. So the whole, as physicists would like to say, the three-dimensional volume of the boundary grows quadratically instead of cubically. Because only the radius, only this tooth sphere grows. It grows like R squared, but in ordinary space it grows like R cubed. And uh, that's right. It, it, therefore, it looks more like something in R3 than something in R4. You, you kill the R4 scale by fixing it. It's, it's, it's simple, but and you, hey, you can write the formulas down, and uh, lots of ways, and you can write down twister spaces and all sorts of things for it. Uh, it's a, um, one of the oldest metrics of this kind known. It's a hypercalo metric, and uh, but people have generalized it in lots of ways. You get multi, you get multi with many points. You can get hyperbolic versions of it. You can then, then you get these. Well, those that since something's using uh, the abelian theory, then you get the non-abelian theory. So it's the beginning. It's the first example of a manifold of this type, really, and it's been known for a long, long, long time. But the interesting thing about this manifold that Hitchin and I have discovered was that it looks asymptotically like the Taub nut, but with the wrong sign. And physicists were worried about what this meant. And if you take the one with the wrong sign, it, asymptotically, and you bring it in inside then you find it acquires a singularity. But that's because you try to maintain the circular symmetry. And this, this time, not the circular symmetry gets destroyed and it disappears and the manifold doesn't have a singularity. And it's in a very beautiful way in which the circular symmetry in the, in the, in the extra dimension gets converted into the rotational symmetry in space in a very subtle way. You interchange what physicists would call the gauge freedom and the spatial freedom. Uh, it's a... It's a so it's an easy bit of geometry to look at, but that you, you can learn a lot, lot from studying it. For example, in, the, um, in this ma manifold, which we studied, the Hitch and I studied this, what you might call the dynamics, the geodesics. And it's a very interesting manifold. It has a, it's a four-dimensional manifold. Inside it, there are some totally geodesic surfaces. And you look at these surfaces. And the, the surfaces are two types. One is, looks like a paraboloid. It's, and you can think of the paraboloid as a kind of cone where you smooth out the vertex, okay? And, this would and then the geodesic on this one would correspond to rolling a marble down the surface of this, it comes out the other side. But there's, then there's another class of surfaces which start out looking like, they look like a cone, but when they come to the bottom, and they, don't start, they don't become paraboloid, they form a hole, like a funnel. And then you go right through the hole. So in this, in the geometry, you have a very nice bit of geometry. If you roll a marble down such a funnel, depending how, what speed you give the marble, it can either go right down the hole, or it can go down the hole so far and then it comes up again. The angular momentum brings it up again. All these are different features of the geodesics. So the geodesics on this manifold are extremely interesting. And uh, the corresponding spectral theory is already very interesting too. So it's a, it's a lo lovely manifold. Uh, it's four-dimensional, so it's hard to f fully understand. But these two-dimensional surfaces you can see. But the two-dimensional surfaces come in these different pairs. as the sort of open paraboloids and there are the funnels, and they, they, are, they, they switch roles in some way. It's a, you can look at my book with Hitchin, and you can see all the pictures. And I, there's even a video we made uh, with IBM, who did, did, helped us. They made a nice video, three-dimensional video showing, well, this, this geodesic motion in the space. This space is supposed to correspond to two m monopoles, or monopole of charge two. And when the things are very far apart, it looks like you have two spheres far apart. Then you, when you come together, then you get into the interactive region. And as the two spheres come together, they collide, and you ask what is the interaction. And because this thing is given by a non complicated soliton, it's not straightforward. And so, you find, so we were able to do a video showing you put two particles, two spheres, you come together, and you, you draw a color, nice color picture showing the, the energy density of the sphere, and then the two come together. First thing that happens when the two spheres come together, then they suddenly change into a torus. And, the, and then after the collision, the torus splits apart, but it splits apart in a different way. You have two things falling this way, and then in a perpendicular direction, it breaks off that way. So you come in, you get what you call 90-degree scattering, which is part of the geometry. And then if you start to um, vary what the physical the impact parameter. You have two things that are going to collide, but you might displace them a little bit. So they don't collide. Of course, if you displace them very far, they have no effect. But if you displace a little bit, what, what happens? And then the, the, it turns out that um, the, the, this thing, although it, the, there are actually three distinguished axes in the story, so the, the, the separation 
that you can make that is different ones where you move in this plane or in that plane. In one plane, you get the picture of a, of a paraboloid, and you describe the gestics there. It looks like coming in and going out at right angles, and then the other one, you get this funnel. And when you get the funnel, what happens is the two particles come in together, a little bit apart, and then they go off eventually at right angles in the same direction, with there's no separation. And it looks like that you've lost the angular momentum of the system because two particles which are separated have an angular momentum. But what happens is the two particles come off. They have no angular momentum, but they have now acquired the electric charge. And the electric charge, magnetic charge, you convert so angular momentum from space into the electromagnetic field. And they come away spinning. Uh, and sometimes they go away for a short while, and then they come back to the plane. That's when the funnel, the ball runs low, the funnel comes up again. Sometimes they will go uh, and go off forever in a different direction. And they, they spin. Well, you can, you, you can describe it by pictures showing a spinning particle, meaning it has electric charge. So it has a lot of very beautiful features as an example of a nonlinear system which is soluble, more or less soluble, um, showing ex unusual phenomena of interactions and so on with some physical meaning. It's a very, very subtle uh, manifold. It has very, probably quite remarkable, unexpected properties, which you wouldn't expect. And I think it's a, it's a model. It's, I like to think of it as a model for what might happen in other more complicated systems. First of all, this 90 degree interaction, which is quite surprising, and then these other more complicated stories. So, uh, <coughs> I've given lectures, when I end of the lecture, I show the video, you know, the movie. Come and, come and watch the movie. Yeah, I think it's available somewhere. Oh, another question. There is a, for, the, for the space that the particles live in there, and what kind of four-dimensional four space uh, that physicists or mathematicians like to choose to describe the particles inside? Uh, well, sorry, you, I, I'm not sure your question. There are two different sort of things. Uh, physicists who do string theory, they choose some big manifold of 10, 11 or 12 dimensions, and then they imagine a string moving around in there, and the, the dynamics of that is meant to be quantum fields. There's no for the, for the four and the different, different manifolds will give you, you have different kind of manifolds, you have different Calabi R's and so on. That's what string theory people do. I'm doing something different, more elementary. I say in four dimensions, I add any one, not all the other dimensions, and then I choose a particular manifold to represent a particular particle. The ma geometry of the manifold is the nature of the particle. No, that's it. The particle asks, what is a proton? A proton is this. You know, I take it out of my pocket or put it on the shelf and you can admire it. It's a manifold with this shape, the geometry. That's the proton for me. But then if I have to make these things collide, I have to have put many protons together. They have to come together, break apart. And that would be the dynamics that I vaguely referred to. But for me, I'm trying to make a model where the particle is very naively thought of like a soliton. It's an object, which is a nonlinear smooth manifold, and uh, which soliton theory was always supposed to describe, a soliton. So <laughs> it's, it's a bit different from uh, what string theory people do. It's a very different philosophy. They use the manifold, but mind you, this, this whole subject of string theory is full of dualities. The duality means you look at it one way, I look at it the other way, and they're really the same. <laughs> and, you know, some studies may say, wow, well, what I've done here, turn it around another way, and this. this. And there are some hints of this already, because these Spaces I used here came from magnetic monopoles on the one hand, and they came from gravitational instantons on the other one. They're models for things in electromagnetism and linked for gravitation. So they're in the world of physics. All these models have been used with different physical interpretations, and sometimes the physical interpretation is part of a big theory that says you can dualize, and this can become this, and this can become this. It's a fantastic uh, game that the string theories play, and uh, I, I appreciate it. It's a nice game, but this is much more, so far, much more elementary, but it may lock, lock into place. It may be somebody can come and say, plug it in here, and it'll shine a bit of light on some part of the theory. But we'll see.